Well, thank you all for coming. And uh, as Leslie said, we're especially happy to see uh, so many teachers here tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to have a chance to talk with John Alter uh, about uh, Franklin Roosevelt, both because I myself am, a, at least among other things, a historian of the New Deal, uh, but also because uh, John has been a friend for over 30 years. In fact, originally one of my students, uh, many years, more years ago than either of us would like to admit. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a great admirer of his book, uh, The Defining Moment. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm looking forward both to hearing from the audience, but also uh, f uh, looking forward to talking with John. And let me just begin by asking you, uh, there are few people in American history who have been more written about than Roosevelt. Uh, and in fact, there are more than one uh, books already about the first 100 days uh, of Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. So what, what led you to decide to write about this particular moment in Roosevelt's life? And, and what, what, what did, questions did you think still needed to be answered? Um, first of all, at the risk of turning this into a mutual admiration society, uh, I have to tell you that um, not only did, did Alan, when I studied under him at Harvard, help to develop my interest in history um, and in this period, uh, you were working on your PhD at that time on Father Coughlin and Huey Long, and I remember being just completely uh, entranced by the way you handled all of that. But then on this book, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, you know, he read the manuscript and helped me out and blurbed it, and so I'm indebted to him in uh, more ways than uh, I can express, and also for his friendship. Um, in terms of uh, how I thought to do this book, um, there's a, a kind of a, a peculiar story that relates to uh, television news, of all things. Um, at the end of the 20th century, uh, Jeff Zucker, who's now the president of NBC, was then the executive producer of the Today Show, and I was at that time and continue to be uh, a part-time moonlighting correspondent for NBC in addition to writing my Newsweek column. And uh, we decided to do a series on big events of the 20th century, um, and we chopped it up in different ways. You know, we did a piece on what was the great medical breakthrough of the 20th century and so forth. And one of the pieces that I did uh, for that program was, we called it, what was the biggest what if of the 20th century? And we decided to review several candidates. You know, what if the Archduke Franz Ferdinand had turned one direction instead of the other in Sarajevo in 1914 when we've had World War I, and what if JFK had put up the bubble top in Dallas, would we have, you know, what would have happened if he hadn't been assassinated? And one of the ones I, I uh, got intrigued by and, and put in the piece, just a couple sentences, was what if Giuseppe Zangara, an unemployed bricklayer from New Jersey, who got off five shots at Franklin Roosevelt from 25 feet away two weeks before Roosevelt was sworn in. What if he had killed Roosevelt, as by all odds he should have, uh, and uh, a John Nance Garner, uh, who was a horrible speaker and had a lot of other issues, had become president? You know, what, what would have happened to our uh, country? So I got intrigued um, by that. By the way, um, for the teachers in the audience, uh, uh, I think many of you know because it's been treated as uh, a footnote in a lot of other books, I, I elevate it to uh, greater importance. But um, Roosevelt uh, did not get hit, but Anton Cermak, the mayor of Chicago, was shot and killed in that incident uh, in Miami in February of 1933. And, uh, in researching the, the book, I, I wondered, well, what was Cermak doing down in Miami? Um, and uh, he went there partly for some R&R, uh, &R, but mostly to plead the case for Chicago teachers who had not been paid for the duration of the 1932-33 school year. It gives you some idea of what was going on in this country. This city of Chicago was broke and they were living uh, uh, with uh, money from loan sharks or their family or what have you. Um, and Cermak, who had not supported Roosevelt's nomination, didn't really get very far with FDR, um, who did not come to the aid of the Chicago teachers. But 
it just gives you an idea a little bit of the desperate straits the country was in. So anyway, I thought about, I got interested in that incident and I started to uh, compare it to, um, and I remember asking Alan about this early on, uh, when Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981, shortly after becoming president, and his budget and tax proposals had been dead on arrival in, uh, in Washington, and suddenly they went sailing through Congress. And I had a suspicion that um, having survived an assassination attempt, maybe it was more important than a footnote, and that it might have actually had some effect effect on the changing uh, attitude of the American public toward Franklin Roosevelt. And indeed, I, I found out um, uh, at the Roosevelt Library that indeed uh, it did have that effect. So I got interested in that first. And then I, uh, just very quickly, I, I submitted a book proposal for a book about uh, Roosevelt in this 1932-33 period on September 10th, 2001 to my book editor. And I then put the whole thing aside and you know, went down to ground zero with Rudy Giuliani and Bush and saw his defining moment down there with the bullhorn and, and thought this is, seems very uh, irrelevant to my concerns, uh, what happened 70 years ago. And about six months later, uh, having given up on the idea, I, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, you know, I think I'm gonna, to myself, I'm gonna start working on this book again because the issue our country is facing is leadership in a time of crisis. And I'm interested in the, the components uh, of leadership and what, what it feels like and tastes like great leadership. And so it brought me back to this, uh, this period, which, um, first of all, almost every book of the last uh, 25 years about FDR has been either uh, you know, a one-volume biography where this period is, it goes by at 500 miles an hour, or it's been about his World War II leadership. It's been quite a while since there's been a focus on, on this period, and there actually wasn't, unless you include some of the multi-volume biographies, there actually ha had never been a book uh, explicitly devoted to this. The 100 Days was always seen as the prelude, the opening chapter, uh, of the Roosevelt presidency, and I decided I'd flip that and look at it as the climax of a piece of exquisite political theater that he performed. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's the climax of the book instead of its usual places, kind of the opening of, uh, of other, uh, uh, other people's books about the period. I think, as, as you've already suggested, the, uh, the first 100 days were not only a, a defining moment for the country and, uh, and a defining moment for the presidency <coughs> uh, and the uh, assault on the Great Depression, but also a defining moment for Franklin Roosevelt as a leader. Uh, a lot has been written, some of it exaggerating the case, but uh, many people have written about what a relative lightweight uh, Franklin Roosevelt seemed to many people uh, prior to his inauguration, uh, even after having been a relatively successful governor of New York. Uh, this has probably uh, uh, helped along this condescending view of Roosevelt, helped along by the fact that he had had polio and had been out of politics for a long time. and. Uh, and of course, as we now know, although many Americans at the time didn't know, never really recovered from it. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what, it was, what it was that Roosevelt did that made him such a towering figure in world history from being such a relatively minor figure, even as a president-elect coming into office. Well, that, that was really the question. You put your finger on the question that really intrigued me. Uh, is where did he get the confidence to pull off this, this conjuring act and, and turn himself into a, a great man? Um, so uh, I do open the book with quite a bit about his, his background. Uh, and he was seen uh, as a lightweight, even within his own family. He was called F.D. Roosevelt, Feather Duster Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, he was also a snob, Frances Perkins, the first woman in the cabinet who served with him all the way through. She knew him when he was in the New York State Senate, and she remembers him, that, that wonderful FDR with his you know, chin up, that great sign of confidence with the cigarette holder. In those days, it was his nose in the air. He was, 
He was a very, as he admitted, he was an awfully mean cuss. He was uh, so bad a lawyer at the New York firm of Carter Ledger that the managing partner, as uh, Jeff Ward uh, first tells this story in his wonderful uh, book, uh, First Class Temperament, um, the managing partner went to um, uh, Sarah Roosevelt and said, it's no use, he can't be a lawyer. So of course he went into politics. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and then he got uh, critical experience as Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Woodrow Wilson. And so he really, it was very important for his presidency because he really understood how government worked and how not to get buffaloed by other bureaucrats because he'd been one himself. Um, and, uh, but he was still seen as a lightweight. They used that, that word about him uh, when he went into politics. Uh, he had not distinguished himself very well when he ran uh, for vice president uh, in 1920, uh, the year before he got polio, um, and he made several gaffes on the campaign trail. Uh, he was clearly an inferior governor to Al Smith, um, and they uh, developed quite a rivalry that really intrigued me. Um, and Roosevelt had to, for his own self-confidence and, and his own sense of destiny, he had to, um, I have a chapter entitled, I, I have to do it myself. And that's what he said to Francis Perkins at one point because uh, Al Smith had wanted uh, his aides, uh, Robert Moses, who developed a famous feud of his own with FDR, and a fantastic woman named Belle Moskowitz, who was essentially running New York State in the 1920s. And uh, uh, Smith assumed that FDR was so weak that he'd just go down to Warm Springs and let uh, Bell Moskowitz and, uh, and Bob Moses uh, uh, and Al Smith, who took a suite in a hotel in Albany, continue to run New York State in uh, 1929. Roosevelt had another, other ideas. He hired his own people uh, and, uh, and started to make his own way. And that was psychologically very important. The polio, of course, was critical, and I have a chapter called Warm Springs Dress Rehearsal, because what he did there when he went down and, and spent a third of his fortune buying this ramshackle resort in Georgia and, and turning it into a rehabilitative clinic, he lifted the people who had polio up without actually curing their polio or his own, but he restored their hope and faith in the future. And when he got to Washington in the 100 days, he lifted up the paralyzed country, even though we didn't get out of the Depression until World War II. So he had an ability to inspire people, make them feel better. As Winston Churchill said, meeting them was like opening a bottle of champagne. And yet, I think that people sensed that beneath that cheerfulness, um, there had been this suffering, and it had deepened him, and it bound people to him. And I think they... They knew he had polio, they didn't know the extent of it, but they sensed that if he had been able to come through that, then maybe the American people could too. Um, and it, it deepened those connections. Remember, before this point, uh, if you had a disease like polio, you were shunted into these asylums. They call them literally in New York City, asylum for the ruptured and crippled. Or you'd be in the back room and you were shunned. If you wanted a joke, a laugh on the radio, you'd make a joke about spastics. Um, uh, there was a huge stigma attached uh, to um, people with disabilities. And so I, I, I think that uh, in some ways, um, his ability to become great was linked to his ability to transcend uh, his disability and, and, and and turn a, a perceived weakness into a great strength. I don't think he ever would have even been uh, nominated, uh, much less elected, had he not had polio, because it gave him that X factor. Otherwise, he would have been like Theodore Roosevelt Jr. or you know, other sons of presidents or other people who uh, you know, don't quite have it. And, and suffering, uh, <laughs> suffering is not always ennobling but it, it can change people profoundly, and, and in Roosevelt's case, it gave him uh, the, uh, the suppleness of mind, the open-mindedness, 
uh, that was absolutely critical, and it turned him into a good listener, um, as well as continuing to be a big talker, uh, but a, a, a person who um, distrusted experts because so many of the doctors had uh, messed up, and that was critical to his success, um, but mostly into somebody who was uh, tremendously open, open-minded, and I, I believe that's the single biggest contrast between President Roosevelt and President Bush. They had tremendous similarities before coming to office. Both called lightweights, you know, strong mothers, famous names, and yet they, uh, they responded very differently when they got to office. I think uh, just in, in terms of the polio, it's important to, to remember that not only was it a, a, a tremendous shaping influence on Roosevelt, but it was also something that he understood, as, as John made clear, would be a stigma if, uh, if the public really saw him as a cripple. And he went to unbelievable lengths to hide his paralysis uh, in all the hundreds of thousands of photographs of Roosevelt, uh, I think there are only two right. that have ever been discovered of him sitting in a wheelchair. And they, they were taken by the family and didn't, didn't, weren't, didn't become visible until long after his death. And yet he spent most of his life in a wheelchair uh, after 1921. When he traveled, uh, I mean, you think about the way in which the Secret Service and security uh, uh, people sort of prepare the way for a president today. Uh, they would build huge plywood walls in front of buildings so that he could ride up in his car and be lifted out of the car without anybody seeing him. The uh, Statler Hilton Hotel in New York was built in part to create a ballroom uh, into which Roosevelt could be wheeled in an underground garage rather than have to come in through the front door. Um, so it, it, when you look at political cartoons of Roosevelt in the early 30s, and he's always seen as someone who's running and jumping and leaping. Uh, the public's view of him was not someone who was in a wheelchair, but someone who was virile and active, and he right. did the best he could, and, and, it was a very, and the best he could was very good, uh, to in effect deceive them. I, I mean, I, I think it was a benign deception, but it, it, was, it was a deception. But it wasn't deceiving them that he was unimpaired, it was deceiving them about the extent of it. And he wanted, the, the, the spell that he wanted to cast was that he had overcome his polio. Because right. one of the things I didn't know before researching the book is that when he was nominated, uh, the announcers on the radio said, uh, you know, President Roosevelt, who uh, suffered from infantile paralysis, is now being uh, helped to his feet, approaching the podium. And when Hoover and his men heard that on the radio, they said, we've won the election. Everybody knows now, everybody knows he's a cripple. No way he's gonna win. Um, so he went, as you said, to great pains to make it seem like you know, that had been a problem that he had overcome. Uh, and, and it's really quite remarkable that he was able to maintain this, uh, this fiction. And I, you know, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm a historian. Uh, I've been interested in history all my life. I didn't really know that Franklin Roosevelt couldn't walk until my first year in graduate school. Uh, and I'd read you know, lots of books about Roosevelt. Even the books about Roosevelt didn't talk about his paralysis in a, in a frank and open way. Uh, the movie Sunrise at Campobello, the movie and play Sunrise at Campobello created uh, this, this myth of Roosevelt you know, learning to walk again and, and the, uh, his, his speech at the 1924 convention being the first step of his recovery. Uh, so it's, it's really a remarkable story in and of itself, and it's, uh, it's a, also a sign of how different the political world of the 1930s is from our world, because no one could get away with that today. Yeah, and people say, well, so he couldn't have been elected, um, but I actually think nowadays, because our attitude towards these things are different, that um, he was such a, a terrific, compelling communicator that uh, he would have just gone on Oprah you know, and, and he would have been fine. He would have still been elected uh, from his wheelchair. Um, but it, it, I, I wondered early on, how did he get away with it with the press? Because the press could be very aggressive then, and particularly their, their owners were very anti-Roosevelt. Um, but essentially what he did was, 
he, uh, early on, before he was elected, um, uh, they, they just knew they you know, wouldn't be able to, to cover him, and it was sort of verboten to take these pictures. Um, but then you wondered, how did it go on for so long? And I think the answer was there was an a, 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 uh, unspoken deal. He had two press conferences a week, which is unimaginable now. Uh, two a week, you know, if we get two a month in the modern presidency, it's a lot. And, um, and the, the deal was, you know, you want to keep coming to these press conferences and be able to bat it around with the President of the United States, well, your news organization better not uh, break the rules or you're not going to be here anymore. Um, so everybody, I think the press kind of considered it a, a fair trade. They were getting access in, in, in response. They, uh, they respected, uh, respected that. But they didn't take any chances either. And even at the inauguration, they built these big uh, wooden uh, ramps and, and barriers that, that Alan talked about to make sure that nobody saw him in the wheelchair. And in fact, the Secret Service would uh, take cameras away from photographers who photographed him being lifted right. into a car or in uh, other, other... There's places. one movie um, that uh, Bob Clark, who's here from, uh, from the Roosevelt Library at Hyde Park, uh, let me know about it, and I watched up there, uh, that was taken uh, in Poughkeepsie in late 1933 that shows him with that fake walk where he's got one hand on the cane and the other uh, on his son or bodyguard's arm, and he, and he very, very slowly swivels his hips to... to pretend to walk um, very slowly, and, and a uh, local doctor got it on film for about 10 seconds before they, they got him, pushed him out of the way. And that, that's all. That's the only thing that exists. So let, me, uh, let me ask you to say a little bit about the, uh, the, the first hundred, or maybe more than a little bit, about the first hundred days of, uh, of the New Deal, which is the principal subject of your book. Uh, when we look back on the great achievements of the New Deal, um, the Wagner Act, Social Security, uh, uh, minimum wage, I mean, a whole range of things, relatively few of them actually date from the first 100 days. Uh, and yet, those first 100 days were the critical days, as you, as you argue in your book, in establishing Roosevelt as a great leader. Do you want to just... Uh, yeah, I, I had... Uh, it you know, you go through cycles when you write a book, and I, I remember when that first occurred to me, and I thought, oh, what am I doing? Should I be even writing this? And then when I looked more closely at it, I found that <laughs> even though uh, most of the legislation uh, was superseded by other legislation, uh, it set the template for what followed um, it, and in, in this respect. Uh, take uh, the securities industry. Uh, everybody points to the Securities Act of 1934 that created the Securities and Exchange Commission as being the, the critical act. But um, in 19, the Securities Act of 1933 was actually the first time that Wall Street was regulated. Originally, uh, you had to uh, register with um, the FTC. Uh, the first idea was to have people who wanted to sell stock register with the post office. That would have been cute. Um, but in his message to Congress, and that, those were the, that was the spine of these 15 pieces of legislation were messages to Congress. He said to the ancient idea of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, we add a new one for all time. Let the seller beware. If you want to make representations to the public, uh, they better be accurate, or the government is going to come down on you uh, if you want to sell stock. Now that is the foundation of financial transparency, and financial transparency is the foundation of our economy and indeed of the global economy. So financial transparency as an idea began in the first hundred days. Um, now, another example. Um, before this period that I think of as the defining moment, if you were uh, starving or in trouble, um, uh, drowning from a, a hurricane in New Orleans, and they had a big Mississippi River flood in the, in the 1920s that, uh, you know, Hoover helped organize some voluntary, uh, at mostly voluntary efforts. If you were, if that happened to you, it really wasn't Washington's business. 
beyond trying to do what Hoover and others did to, to, to coordinate some help. There was no social contract that said if you were in trouble, the government was going to come to your assistance. And what amazed me after Katrina was, um, you know, people argued about the kind of job the government did, but nobody, even the most right-wing analysts said, hey, it's, it's nobody's business in government if people are in trouble. Uh, because something very permanent changed in that first 100 days when Roosevelt came in a variety of ways uh, to the aid of people uh, in trouble. And then the Civilian Conservation Corps, I thought, was really the crowning achievement uh, of, of the 100 days because that was the first jobs program and it showed that you could take a problem that people considered to be impossible to address and you could dent that problem in short order with the political will and capacity to do it. It was the largest, fastest mobilization in American history. 250,000 young hobos you know, out clearing trails, planting uh, what became billions of trees. Um, and and uh, it, it completely changed uh, people's idea of what was possible. Everybody told Roosevelt it, it couldn't happen and it wouldn't happen, and he made it happen. Uh, and it also saved the topography uh, of the United States, not to mention producing people like George Marshall, who were so important in World War II. Uh, the first idea of uh, integrated armed forces, which Truman did, really uh, began with the CCC and many uh, many other things. And then there were some bad ideas. You know, the NRA turned out to be a pretty bad idea. And there were some good conservative ideas. The New Dealers, sometimes history is what doesn't happen, you know, in terms of Roosevelt not being killed. Well, another example of that is that after this horrible banking crisis, 10,000 banks out of business, people's life savings wiped out, uh, complete lack of trust in, in banking, the New Dealers' response, uh, including Robert Wagner and, and most of the other New, New Dealers, was, well, of course, nationalize the banks. Uh, everybody knows that that's what's going to happen, right? We're going to nationalize the banks. And Roosevelt said, no, we're going to keep banking in private hands. And their fallback position was the same as with the stock market. Postal banks, let people borrow money from the post office. Roosevelt rejected that, too. And he rejected all calls for constitutional amendments and all calls uh, for him to be a dictator, which was a positive word at that time, uh, even though he was uh, tempted to take dictatorial powers. You, you mentioned the NRA, and of all the, uh, the, the uh, legislative achievements of the first 100 days, by far the most famous, the biggest, the most important, and for a while the most popular was the NRA. Uh, those of you who are old enough and to, to have uh, remembered the 30s will remember the Blue Eagle, which was on every window. Uh, these enormous uh, NRA parades in New York and in cities around the country. Uh, it was a huge propaganda exercise in addition to being a, a substantive, if unsuccessful, uh, economic exercise. Um, and there's this strange sort of quality of the NRA as being a critical element of the elevation of the New Deal to a, uh, of its image as a, as a powerful, energetic, forceful administration. And yet, the NRA was a terrible idea uh, and an entirely unsuccessful idea. Would you agree with that? And do you, you want yeah, to talk a I mean, more I, about I, the? Yeah, I mean, I defer to you, and I'd like, uh, you know, I think uh, Alan is really um, the premier historian on what happened to the New Deal. You know, how the whole thing played out, and and I know much less about that, uh, particularly how it played out when the ideas had been around for a few years. Um, but what really struck me was that uh, none of this was a blueprint. Uh, Ray Moley, who was uh, Roosevelt's uh, top aide at the time, later became a conservative, said that to call the New Deal a plan was like saying that uh, a little boy's bedroom full of dirty clothes, broken baseball bats, and old chemistry sets that had all been put there by an interior decorator. 
You know, there, there, was, there was really, it was seat of the pants, very instinctive stuff. And uh, the key um, speech, what uh, Sam Rosenman, uh, uh, important Roosevelt aide, uh, called uh, the watchword of the New Deal, was a speech he gave in the 32 campaign that was written by a guy who later became a columnist for Newsweek. Nowadays, if I wrote a speech for a candidate, I'd justifiably be fired, but in those days, it was, it was okay. And uh, they were giving Roosevelt a hard time over his, his speeches and saying, you're not saying anything, Governor. And he said, oh, well, you, you can do better. So this, this guy, uh, uh, Ernest Lindley, wrote a speech saying, we need bold, persistent experimentation. Take one method and try it. If it fails, admit failure frankly. That's kind of a novel idea nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> and, tr and try another. But above all, try something. So what Roosevelt did was he took this reputation that he had as a flip-flopper. You know, he was for the League of Nations before he was against the League of Nations. He wasn't a wet on prohibition. He wasn't a dry. He was a damp. And this is, everybody in New York, believe me, if you had been in New York in 1932, you probably wouldn't have been for Franklin Roosevelt for president because he seemed unprincipled. But what he did was he took that reputation and he turned it into its own very important principle, which was experimentation, flexibility, work the problem, throw things against the wall, don't just stand there, do something. So when he got to the first 100 days, and uh, you had, uh, in the case of the NRA, you had Senator Hugo Black later on the Supreme Court, who uh, is just about to get a bill through that requires a 30-hour work week. Terrible idea, requires it. And Roosevelt, thinking about you know dairy farmers he knew in upstate New York, you can't require a 30-hour work week. We have to do something, though, to address uh, the, these concerns about the collapse of our industrial economy. So he, he, uh, he had Moley and some other guys put, pull together all of the various uh, industrial policy ideas and kind of smush them together in this National Recovery Act. Um, and on the day he signed the bill, he still wasn't sure who was going to run it. He ended up splitting authority for it. Uh, and it, you know, it led to restraint of trade, price fixing, uh, all sorts of bad things uh, for the economy. But it was probably worth doing because what it said to the public was, there's hope. We're going to pull together and we're going to get out of this. We're going to... Uh, and, it was extremely important in sort of showing forward motion against uh, the Depression. And so he understood that sometimes action, and he used that word five times in his inaugural address, was, was most important even if the particular remedy wasn't right because he could always get rid of it later as, as he often did. I think John has pointed to a very important uh, part of the New Deal, and it's something, in fact, that historians, some historians, still consider a weakness in Roosevelt, his lack of principle, uh, the lack of coherence. Richard Hofstadter, one of the great historians of the 20th century, uh, wrote about Roosevelt in the Age of Reform in a fairly skeptical way, and he called the New Deal a chaos of experimentation, which was a kind of barbed compliment at best. Um, but I think if you, if you think about America in the 1930s, even after four years of depression when Roosevelt entered office, and you think of all of the, what we now consider archaic ideological commitments that most American leaders, at least, embraced, the gold standard, the balanced budget, uh, I could go on and on. Republicans um, wanted to raise taxes. You know, that's right. The, 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 uh, the um, fiscal stability of the government is more important than the fiscal stability of the nation. Um, the Federal Reserve Board uh, in 1932 raised interest rates. Um, in fact, uh, Milton Friedman calls that the single and most important contribution, not in 1932, in 1930. Uh, Milton Friedman calls that the single most important cause of the Great Depression. Uh, but that was, a, that was a way of uh, protecting uh, lenders. Uh, you know, 
protecting the, the financial elite uh, at a time of financial crisis. So what Roosevelt did is to just brush aside, not, not entirely, I mean he always believed in a balanced budget even though he never made, only once and disastrously uh, made a real effort to, to achieve one. He, he claimed to believe these things, but he didn't act on them. And, and that, John, I think is exactly right that um, this sort, sort of flexible experimentation in a time when nobody really knew the answers uh, was critical. Uh, but see, this is, we're Roosevelt. seeing this now, the, you know, my own analysis of w one of the reasons that President Bush is now, uh, in the new Newsweek poll, he's at 28%. You know, this is down um, comparable to Jimmy Carter at the very bottom of his presidency. Well, why is he there? The economy's relatively good. Uh, we've lost uh, 3,300 people in Iraq, but compared to a lot of other wars, that's not uh, a, a huge number, as tragic as, as it is. Um, I think people sense he's not working their problems, and he's not responding in a flexible way. And Roosevelt understood, and it was a breakthrough idea, that you, you just have to respond. You, uh, and you can't just uh, continue on, uh, on a, in a democratic society uh, on, on a, a stubborn course uh, without making adjustments. And sometimes the adjustments are wrong. He was wrong about a lot of things. He, he was against deposit insurance, and, and he, when he signed the bill for deposit insurance in the 100 days, he, you know, it was over his objections. He kept threatening to veto it, but he, you know, he finally was convinced that, okay, it's worth a try. Uh, and, um, so that, that's, uh, you know, that's very, uh, a, a very important presidential trait, and I think something to look for in, uh, in presidents is their open-mindedness and their there's suppleness, and in that inaugural address where he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, that was nonsense. I mean, if you're worried about putting food on the table and you live in a community with 80% unemployment, you have a lot more to fear than just fear itself, you know, an emotion. You have real things that uh, are making your life, uh, uh, it, 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 that are, are wrecking your life, and as people alive at the time said, this was like 9-11, except much, much bigger you know, that people really wondered, is anything going to be the same after this? The head of the Harvard Business School thought capitalism might be at an end. The president of Columbia, Nicholas Murray Butler, at, at uh, you know, at Allen's institution, said that year that elections uh, are not the best way for a society to select its leaders, and that uh, there was that's, a lot that's of... That's why we love him so. Yeah, at Columbia. Yeah. <laughs> he won the Nobel Prize, too. <laughs> well, I, I can't let this uh, evening close without just uh, saying a word about uh, someone who uh, shaped so much of what both of us have done in thinking about the New Deal and Roosevelt, and that's Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., a dear friend of many people in this room, I'm sure, who died uh, just several weeks ago. Thank you all very much uh, for coming tonight, uh, and uh, thank you, John. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, as Leslie said, we're especially happy to see uh, so many teachers here tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to have a chance to talk with John Alter uh, about uh, Franklin Roosevelt, both because I myself am, a, at least among other things, a historian of the New Deal, uh, but also because uh, John has been a friend for over 30 years, in fact, originally one of my students, uh, many years, more years ago than either of us would like to admit. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a great admirer of his book, uh, The Defining Moment. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm looking forward both to hearing from the audience, but also uh, f uh, looking forward to talking with John. And let me just begin by asking you, uh, 
there are few people in American history who have been more written about than Roosevelt. Uh, and in R and R, but mostly to plead the case for Chicago teachers who had not been paid for the duration of the 1932-33 school year. It gives you some idea of what was going on in this country. This city of Chicago was broke, and they were living uh, uh, with uh, money from loan sharks or their family or what have you. Um, and Cermak, who had not supported Roosevelt's nomination, didn't really get very far with FDR, um, who did not come to the aid of the Chicago teachers. But it, it just gives you an idea a little bit of the desperate straits the country was in. So anyway, I thought about, I got interested in that incident, and I started to uh, compare it to, um, and I remember asking Alan about this early on, uh, when Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981, shortly after becoming president, and his budget and tax proposals had been dead on arrival in, uh, in Washington, and suddenly they went sailing through Congress. And I had a suspicion that um, television news, of all things, um, at the end of the 20th century, uh, Jeff Zucker, who's now the president of NBC, was then the executive producer of the Today Show, and I was at that time and continue to be uh, a part-time moonlighting correspondent for NBC in addition to writing my Newsweek column. And uh, we decided to do a series on big events of the 20th century, um, and we chopped it up in different ways. You know, we did a piece on what was the great medical breakthrough of the 20th century and so forth. And one of the pieces that I did uh, for that program was we called it what was the biggest what if of the 20th century? And we decided to review several candidates. You know, what if the Archduke Franz Ferdinand had turned one direction instead of the other in Sarajevo in 1914? Would we have had World War I? And what if JFK had put up the bubble top in Dallas? Would we have, you know, what would have happened if he hadn't been assassinated? And one of the ones I, I uh, got intrigued by and, and put in the piece, just a couple sentences, was what if Giuseppe Zangara, an unemployed bricklayer from New Jersey who got off five shots at Franklin Roosevelt from 25 feet away two weeks before Roosevelt was sworn in. What if he had killed Roosevelt, as by all odds he should have, uh, and uh, a John Nance Garner, uh, who was a horrible speaker and had a lot of other issues, had become president? You know, what, what would have happened to our uh, country? So I got intrigued um, by that. By the way, um, for the teachers in the audience, uh, uh, I think many of you know, because it's been treated as uh, a footnote in a lot of other books, I, I elevate it to uh, greater importance. But um, Roosevelt uh, did not get hit, but Anton Cermak, the mayor of Chicago, was shot and killed in that incident uh, in Miami in February of 1933. And, uh, in researching the, the book, I, I wondered, well, what was Cermak doing down in Miami? Um, and uh, he went there partly for some... Uh, in fact, there are more than one uh, books already about the first hundred days uh, of Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. So what, what led you to decide to write about this particular moment in Roosevelt's life and, and what, what what, what did, questions did you think still needed to be answered? Um, first of all, at the risk of turning this into a mutual admiration society, uh, I have to tell you that um, not only did, did Alan, when I studied under him at Harvard, help to develop my interest in history um, and in this period, uh, you were working on your PhD at that time on Father Coughlin and Huey Long, and I remember being just completely uh, entranced by the way you handle all of that. But then on this book, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, you know, he read the manuscript and helped me out and blurbed it, and so I'm indebted to him in uh, more ways than uh, I can express, and also for his friendship. Um, in terms of uh, how I thought to do this book, um, there's a, a kind of a, a peculiar story that relates to uh, 